we often ask our, our viewers for suggestions for interviewees and your name has come up a lot. I think you're probably one of our most requested interviewees. I don't want to sort of recap too much on the big picture of your, of your books and your theories because I think there's a lot of that elsewhere. I'd like to direct people to the RSA animation that I think is a really good summation of the, the general thesis. Of, it's a nice introduction, yes. Yes, of Master and his Emissary. But what would be the elevator pitch for Master and his Emissary? It's that we're not aware that our reality is constructed by two different systems, if you like, which focus on different aspects of reality and therefore construe a world with different qualities. And the first part of the book explains that in terms of neuropsychiatry and philosophy. And the second part of the book suggests that in the history of the West, um, three times we have been in a position where, to begin with, a civilization flourished when it kept both these visions together, that of the right hemisphere and that of the left. But that in every case, and I believe we're repeating the pattern for the third time, uh, as uh, the, the, the civilization overreached itself, um, things deteriorated and the mindset became more rigid, more bureaucratic, less imaginative, less flexible, less in touch with reality, and became locked into a way of thinking which is that of the left hemisphere, which is useful. Uh, it's not um, a mistake that we have it, but it cannot be our way of contacting reality. A simple way of putting it is it's like uh, mistaking the map for the territory. And you, you've touched already on what the dangers are of this. Mm. What, why does, do you think this happens? Why do you think this is a pattern that has repeated itself so many times? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, one is that it, the left hemisphere is really a very limited kind of organ. <laughs> it, it's the bit that helps us um, grasp things. Uh, it's relatively simplistic. Um, but it does enable you to grab things. It's the part of your brain that controls your right hand with which we grasp things. And it controls also the aspects of our mental life whereby we say, oh, I've grasped it. But unfortunately, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And it therefore neglects a whole range of things which the right hemisphere does know. But the right hemisphere has no speech. The right hemisphere contributes to language, but speaking, for 97% of us, at any rate of us right-handers, is in the left hemisphere. And so the knowledge that the right hemisphere has is not easily expressible. And as we become more powerful, and in each case the Greeks, the Romans, overreach themselves with empires, and in our case I think simply you know, the West has done the same thing again, um, it's very difficult to let go of this mentality that gives you... I'll have that, I'll take that. Um, and it's a very selfish kind of way of thinking, not a communitarian way of thinking. It's not a broad picture, it's a very narrow picture. It sees the short term, not the long term. And it's perfectly successful in its own terms. But <laughs> if what it doesn't see is it's leading into a blind alley. And one of the criticisms of your work I've seen, and I think you actually addressed it at the beginning of the, the RSA animation, that there was a very simplistic understanding of right brain, left brain in the past, maybe the 60s and 70s. And a lot of people say, well, that's been discredited. The whole idea of these two parts of the brain doing different things has been completely discredited. Yes. Well, that was one of the hurdles I had to get over. Um, and probably if I'd had a regular career where I had to just churn my way through um, a, a, an academic career bringing out papers every, every few months, I'd never have had the leisure and time. Um, well, it wasn't leisure, it was time stolen from my clinical work. But actually, to, I spent 20 years looking at the literature, and there's no question. I mean, it would be absurd to suggest there's no difference. Um, for a start, the most primitive creatures that we know about, going back 700 million years, the very first ones that have a neural network, already have an asymmetrical neural network. And that has simply become uh, more, uh, if you like, more pronounced as we go up the evolutionary tree. 
So um, the two halves of the brain are just clearly different. They're, they're, they're different sizes, different weights, different shapes. They have different uh, so-called gyral patterns. That's the convolutions in the surface of the brain. They uh, have different preponderances of gray and white matter, different preponderances of neurotransmitters. They react differently to hormones. They're just different. And it's no good saying there isn't a difference. Also, psychologically, they're clearly different because we know that the left hemisphere, for example, uh, is the one that speaks. It's the one that does certain aspects of language. And the right hemisphere, we know, has other faculties that uh, I spend the book explaining. So it's just that people latched onto a very simple-minded model, and that model was that of a machine. Now, the question you ask of a machine is, what does it do? And if you ask the question, what does the left hemisphere do and what does the right hemisphere do? The answers that came out of pop psychology in the 70s and 80s, the left hemisphere does reason and language and the right hemisphere does emotion and visual spatial things is not true. They're both involved in everything, but they're involved in different ways, in reliably different ways. So it's not the what of the brain, it's the how. And that's a very important question. But it's not one that scientists are so readily going to ask because they're mainly interested in mechanism. But actually it's as plain as the nose on your face when you come to look at it that there are these vast differences in the disposition of these two neural networks towards the world. They pay attention in completely different ways. And when you pay attention to the world, you see different things in it. Um, and so if they do that, they're going to construct two different versions of the world. We talk a lot on this channel about the meta conversation, mm. the idea that what we need is a conversation that opens up to the not knowing, to what needs to emerge beyond and what it feels like is happening now increasingly with social media yeah. is people are getting stuck more and more in certainty and in what they do know. Is that a right brain, left brain phenomena? Well, it can be looked at in that way, in that one of the features of the left hemisphere is that it prefers what it's already familiar with, um, and it finds it very difficult to shift set. So once it's stuck into something, it keeps on repeating it. Whereas the right hemisphere, Ramachandran, B.S. Ramachandran, well-known neuroscientist, calls it the devil's advocate, because it's able to see other things, and it's saying, yes, but... Yes, but is a Zen saying that I very much like. Um, so you can see it that way. The right hemisphere is much more able to be flexible. And also, very importantly, although, or not although, but just because the two hemispheres have different takes on the world, they have different takes on their own relationship. So the left hemisphere's take is an exclusive one. Either this is right or that is right. And therefore, what I know excludes what you know. Whereas the right hemisphere's take is a both and take, that there's a room for what the left hemisphere does. There's a point in analysis, but there's also a point in synthesis and imagination. And what we are desperately lacking is, is that overall synthesis. It seems to me that at the moment, we officially pride ourselves on being a very free thinking people. Uh, I'm going to sound like a terrible fuddy-duddy, but <laughs> I think it, the intellectual world was far more open in the 60s and 70s when I grew up than it is today. It's closed down to a number of dogmas. Um, the internet, which is a wonderful thing, hasn't helped because it's possible for people to get trapped in bubbles where they reinforce the things they believe without really hearing other points of view. I'm a keen proponent that in education, um, one of the most important things one must do is teach people always to invert everything they believe and see the value in it. In fact, I believe there should be, in government, a department of inverse policy. So whatever the government is uh, proposing, there should be a department that is dedicated to seeing what would happen if we did the precise opposite. And um, it should be you know, centrally funded, and I think it would be a very useful exercise. But really, it's an intellectual exercise that we all need to do. If we start being too certain about anything, it means we've missed something else. This brings us to a very important metaphysical point, which is that a thing and its opposite, according to the left hemisphere, are simply as far apart as they can be, and we move always in a linear way to what we identify as good.
everything I know tells me that in fact opposites are connected and if you pretend that you are only having one you don't notice the dark side and this is terribly true in psychiatry it's almost um, a truism to say that a lot of the work one does as a psychiatrist is helping people to see that there is a good side to what it is that they fear and dislike in themselves, but there is also a dark side to the bits that they pride themselves on, and that you cannot get rid of the dark side, you accept it and work with moving it towards something creative. And all creativity and all life is creative, our mental world is creative, our daily reality is created partly by us, not out of nowhere, but it's grounded in something else, but we help create it. That process depends on opposition. It depends on a degree of resistance, actually. And as soon as you've decided that X, Y, and Z are good, and their opposites are bad, and we must have more and more and more and more of the thing we've decided is good, you end up reaping a whirlwind, because the things you didn't take note of come back and bite you in the bum. And I think that what we are now seeing in the very destructive and, and, and damaging and regrettable moves of you know, Brexit and Trump and so on are entirely understandable reactions, which I, I, I can perfectly well forgive, from people who have just been told that their opinions are no good because these are things we don't talk about, these are things that, you know, a liberal person knows that liberty, equality and fraternity is all it's about and the opposites don't matter. So I think we're, we're enduring now a backlash that we could have avoided by having a mature conversation, yes, this is good, but also we've got to take into account that. This is what we've talked about quite a lot on the channel okay. and our, our perspective is that we're seeing the shadow of liberalism that Trump and Brexit are both the shadow of liberalism. I didn't know that that was what you said, but it's exactly what I believed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned a lot of different uh, psychological things. I mean, Jung's idea of the shadow is yes, a perfect one. Yes, yes. And it, at some sense, it feels to us that this is the time of the integration of the shadow, that what we're seeing through the democratization of different forms of media is all the things and the cracks between things that we thought we'd got rid of are now rising up and are going to have to be dealt with. They're going to have to be integrated. Yes. How do we do that? Well, of course, there is no, you're not expecting me to have some simple answer. Um, one of the difficulties is that we have accelerated the pace of change so fast that the kind of changes that we require not only sort of won't, but simply cannot be made to happen that fast. Um, We're in a crisis which requires something to happen very quickly, really, because accelerating technological advance has put machine guns in the hands of toddlers. We have not increased in wisdom. In fact, I believe we have lost wisdom in the West, and yet we have gained enormously and are gaining very fast in power. Inevitably, if you put power in the hands of people who have no wisdom, this is a formula for disaster. And we see it in the current environmental disaster we're facing. We see it in the destruction of species. We see it in the destruction of the lives of indigenous people. We see it in the um, mind control that is already um, being put into effect in China with enormously sophisticated AI that tracks the faces, the movements, the everything, the thoughts of all its citizens. And we believe, oh, well, that's China, but that could never happen here. But that is very naive. Democracy, our kind of democracy is fragile. It's not the norm. It's something very precious. And it can easily be destroyed, especially in an atmosphere where we don't know who or what to believe, which is becoming more and more a problem. So we have got ourselves into a very difficult situation, and I'm not suggesting there is an easy fix to it. But there are things that we could do um, to try and get away from this. I mean, one, they're going to have to involve radical changes. We can't expect to go on living the kind of lives we do with the demands on the world. That's just not sustainable. They're not sustainable even for us. And now that um, ten times as many people will want to claim these rights to extraordinary privilege, the world simply cannot sustain it. So we've been living on, on fool's gold, if you like. So what are the practical things that can be done if, if your diagnosis is correct? 
and that we're looking at a, a world that's ever more sort of narrow and, and rational. How do we get out of that? <laughs> yes. Easier said than done. Um, and there are patients that you cannot help, which is one of the first things you have to know in my trade. Um, but I believe one of the things I can do, I can't do much, but one thing I can do is raise awareness. And I think that's happening. So people are becoming much more aware of, in a way I've opened people's minds to things they already knew. One of the commonest things people say is I had this feeling of sudden recognition that all my life I kind of felt all this but had no way of articulating it. So I think that that is one thing. So of course it's just a start. In terms of practical things, I mean we've got to begin by completely rethinking education. At the moment it's about shoveling information into people, not training them to think uh, critically, to think um, imaginatively. Uh, I was lucky in that in my education I was taught to to think all sides of a question. As soon as I believed something passionately, I would be asked to defend the exact opposite position, which is a very important exercise that I think no one should leave school without doing. You know, this is what you believe, speak about it. Now, speak about and defend the opposite position, and we will score you on how well you do that exercise. That is good. But it's also about imagination. I mean, education is drawing out faculties within people. It's not shoveling facts into people. That is the reverse of education. So I think the emphasis on, you know, a, a, a cliched um, caricature would be, but it's not unfortunately that far from the truth, you're doing English A-level, there are six points you must make about Jane Austen. You know, to me that is the death of English literature. And so is conforming it to current preoccupations, with what, however brilliant we think they are, uh, filtering it through isms of you know, political correctness. Instead of putting all that to the side and simply opening oneself to the incredible gift of something that somebody created, which can work on you in all kinds of ways that you don't now conceive. The more you approach things with preconceptions, the worse it is. This, this was really interesting, watching the documentary you sent over. Mm. Um, you mentioned identity politics as a left brain phenomena, that it's effectively, it's, a cert, it's another certainty, or it can become another certainty, because what we're doing through that is, for example, you're taking a work of literature and you're critiquing it not in the way that it kind of reflects the grandeur of the human spirit or the developmental journey of the individual. It's, it's, it's about, okay, how does it, it... Which immediately diminishes it from that to that. Yes. yes. And can you talk about that as a, and there's as nothing a, new in it as a left brain as a left brain phenomena I can, but I'd also first like to um, just gloss your remark because it's interesting. I didn't actually mention identity politics anywhere in the film, but what happened? Did you say political correctness, or was this someone no, else who put it no. in? What happened was, and I didn't know this, that in the film, as you know, Rowan Williams is interviewed. And the way the film was made was I would go and meet somebody, we would be film talking together, and then there was always a bit where I went out and they just talked to that person, because then they were free to say whatever they wanted to say. And a bit that I had never seen until the film was completed was where Rowan Williams chose for some reason to talk about um, the angry um, black and white views of people who just know what is right and won't listen to other people and want it legislated. And he just said, you, you cannot create a better society by legislating this kind of thing. We need to develop a society in which people can have, we can listen to one another and have reasonable conversations. And he actually made the point that by trying to stamp out certain things, you don't diminish the anxiety behind it, you ramp it up, which is exactly what we're seeing. Which is another psychological truth of repression. Yes. I mean, one of the, there are many problems here. The one is the left hemisphere is far too certain uh, that it knows what's what. Uh, it's far too clear that um, things are unipolar, that there are just goods. Whereas, you know, once you see something that is much clearer in Oriental tradition, that everything has, comes inevitably with its opposite, you don't think like that anymore. 
It doesn't see things contextually. It doesn't see individuals. It's not prepared to listen to another point of view. It's just saying, this guy I have heard on Twitter has said something in a, which is now a soundbite. You don't hear all, all the rest that went round it. You don't see this as part of somebody's journey that it might be worth listening to. You just dismiss it. Now, I believe very strongly, once again, that it, it's not the what, it's the how. If I've said that before, I'm going to say it again and again. In life, it is not the what, it is the how. It's the disposition you have. Now, I believe it is possible to say anything, and I don't think there should be things that nobody can say. I think we should have a system where anyone can say anything, but they must say it in a way that is not inflammatory and that is open to reason and discussion. So that applies to both sides of a political argument. And in that same section of the film, it made an interesting point that anger lateralizes to the left brain, so yes. that... So that Yes. If we're in a sort of left brain certainty, anger is the result. Anger and aggression, you know, people think the left hemisphere, I mean, the old view was, well, it might be a bit dull, but it's terribly reliable and it's down to earth and it doesn't get emotional. Well, number one, it is not down to earth, it's in a fantasy world. Number two, it is not reliable. Um, there's good work coming out of Gazaniga's lab showing, you know, he was the man who said the right hemisphere has about as much intelligence as a chimpanzee. I mean, that was 30, 40 years ago, but still. His lab is now producing wonderful data showing that the right hemisphere is far more sophisticated at making judgments, much more reliable. The left hemisphere tends to jump to conclusions, is open to bias. And in terms of emotion, the left hemisphere is far from devoid of emotion. The most lateralized of all emotions is anger, and it lateralizes to the left hemisphere. Lateralizers just means what? It, well, it means that um, when people are experiencing anger, there is a, um, a, a great increase in activity in the left hemisphere. And, you know, at the chapter and verse for that, it's somebody called Harmon Jones has done a lot of uh, research into that. But the chapter and verse will be in, in the Master and His Emissary, is in the Master and His Emissary. There was a really interesting example with birds and I don't, maybe you want to kind of explain very simply how... Because that, that, for me, really illustrates the difference between the two, the two ways of, of, of interacting with the world. Yes, well, while the um, you know, human neuroscientists were busy dismissing it, the um, animal uh, scientists were simply getting on with what scientists are supposed to do, which was observing and taking note. And they noticed that birds and animals use their two hemispheres for different purposes. It's easy to observe in a bird because in most birds, the input from the right eye goes straight to the left hemisphere and the input from the left eye goes straight to the right hemisphere. It's not true of humans, uh, it's more complicated. But at least in birds and quite a lot of animals that have eyes on the side of the head, you can tell which hemisphere is engaged by just looking at which eye is being used for this particular moment. And what they noticed was that birds and animals reliably seem to use their left hemisphere for latching on to a small detail, like I need to pick up that piece of seed on the background of grit. Um, and they use their right hemisphere, their left eye, for everything else, for who others are around, is there a predator, um, is my mate nearby because I would like to share this. All that contextual information is the right hemisphere. And the left hemisphere is literally seeing a tiny piece of, of reality. Now that was in itself an aha moment. I could see that this, if this was in any way true about humans, it would have colossal implications because I have a background in philosophy and I know that attention changes the world. So if there's a big difference in attention, one is fragmentary, piecemeal, narrow, the other is broad, sustained and vigilant, they're going to see two different realities. And so that got me into then looking at the human literature and lo and behold, this difference is very marked in human beings. So if people have a right hemisphere stroke, they can have this pathological narrowing of the window of attention, like looking the wrong way down a telescope. And your, the, the sort of the grand theory as well is that 
we are in a world that has concentrated more and more and more on this narrow, atomistic, mechanical way of looking at the world and neglecting the more holistic, the more yes. um, relational aspects. Well, it seems to me, and that's the subject of a book I'm now writing, that actually we don't start from things and then have to work out how they relate and how this thing, this billiard ball hits that one and so on. But in fact, that there are very broad patterns and flows in the world. And that what we call things are the sort of bits that stand out to our attention. Their little nexuses, if you like, that go, oh, I recognise that little familiar thing. That, I'm going to call that a... <clears throat> but actually, everything is part of a larger picture. And the trouble with focusing on detail is not only do you miss the overall meaning, the overall purpose, the overall connection, the way in which this has ramifications, the bits that are not explicit, the thing that is not in the spotlight, which is everything else, but you also think that you can understand the world by taking one thing and putting it to, with another and building it up as you'd build a Meccano set or, you know, mend the bike in the garage. But the world is not like that. I wrote down from the RSA um, animation, mm. left, abstraction, power to manipulate the already known, fixed, static, isolated, decontextualized, explicit, ultimately lifeless right, individual, changing, evolved, interconnected, implicit, incarnate, living, never entirely known. Yes. And that reminded me very much of what Martin Buber talked about, yes. that we have the I-it relationships or the I-thou relationships, which I found very profound. I also studied philosophy when I was, when I was at university, and that, that really stuck with me, that there are two different types of relationships we can have in the world. One, the I-thou is essentially kind of, un there is an unknowability about that relationship. Is that something, do, do you think that maps on? Uh, absolutely. Um, and there is also a reciprocity in the I-thou relationship, whereas in the I-it relationship, it's a unidirectional one, which is about power and influence, whereas the other one is about a reverberative, responsive coming into being of something. So that is a very important distinction, and I relate the I-thou and the I-it to the evolution of language. We won't have time to, because it's a long story, but it's in the book. But in brief, I believe that language emerged from uh, what you might call music. Uh, in other words, the music of speech, the sounds, and that um, denotative language is a kind of special set of a much more richly embedded, embodied, connotative way of communicating. And that it became necessary when we were no longer in groups where you were largely just talking I to thou, but were talking about a third party or something else we had designs on. And so that is how, where language becomes very important. I've seen your work referenced in many, many different places particularly by people who are talking about the more spiritual, the more, even a, an author called Gary Lackman, I don't know if you're yes, aware yes, of him. Yes, yes, yes. So he, he's written a series of books about the, the hidden occult yes. history of Western thought. Yes. And he uses your work as a way of saying, as, as a way of kind of maybe giving it scientific respectability or at least explaining mm -hmm. this could be a process that we're going through, mm -hmm. these, these more holistic ways of knowing have never been part of the Western kind of mainstream tradition and maybe that's because of the right brain, left brain split. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, I think that it's not true that they've not been present in the tradition. Um, I know what he's talking about, um, but they're very much present in pre-Socratic philosophy. Uh, as we know, something very important and I think very damaging happened to Western philosophy with Plato and Aristotle, and particularly with Plato. Um, but these other aspects in the West have been more expressed in our extremely powerful music. Uh, one thing you can say about Western civilization, it, in many ways it's, it, it, it lacks the wisdom of Oriental civilization, but it has produced colossally rich music. And so it also produced, you know, Shakespeare. So I would say our art is where it has been expressed. Mm 
but when we start doing philosophy, we're like, well, we've got to make this consistent, and I see that, and it goes in there, and this bit leads to that. And whereas you're, you're therefore, as, as I say, sort of building things up from little certainties. Well, the first thing is there are no certainties to start from. They're intuited. You have to start from axioms. Uh, reason is based on intuition, and it ends in intuition. Um, so I think there are those elements are there, but they have been sidelined and neglected. The key thing one must remember about the left hemisphere is that it's, it's bright enough, but not very bright. It doesn't really see that there are things that it doesn't know. Um, it's so hermetic, its world is so self contained and consistent and self-referential that it doesn't feel the need of anything else because it's not sensing that there's something bigger. The right hemisphere sees what is implicit, what is going on not just in the foreground but in the, in the background, in the context, in all these things that are everything that we really value, love, um, art, uh, and we used to value spiritual truths, these things are only approachable in an indirect, implicit way. Um, as soon as you start to say, well, we need to pin this down and make it certain, you're already on the wrong track. So I think that's... Uh, Gary's right to point to that. It's just that I think there's more to the story. And you, you talked about um, that rationality begins in intuition. Is that... Well, yes, it has to. I mean, it begins in intuition in two ways. One is that um, we, we can't rationally prove why reason is a helpful tool. We intuit that it is a useful tool. But secondly, when we begin reasoning, we have to begin from quite a host of assumptions. Science uh, officially claims to make no assumptions. It in fact makes quite a few assumptions before it gets started. It has to. That's not a criticism. The system can't work without somewhere to start because nothing can be supported on nothing. It has to be on something before it can get started. So that's what I mean. And it also ends in intuition because the results of reasoning have to be reintegrated into a broader picture. So it's an intermediary tool. Reason, and indeed the left hemisphere, is an intermediary tool. One way of thinking of it is it's like this. When you learn a musical instrument, you're first attracted to a piece of music in a broad sort of way. Then you start trying to play it and you realise you have to go over and over the fingering in bar 18 and, you know, there's a return to the dominant at bar 32 or whatever it is. But then when you've done all that, that's not time wasted, but when you come to perform it, if you're still thinking like that, you can't perform. The relationship with the hemispheres is a bit like that. The immediate grasp of something, the, the overall take on it is right hemisphere. The left hemisphere then gets to work and does procedural matters. But then it's the right hemisphere that must reintegrate that information that is not lost. That process was valuable, but it mustn't stop there. In a nutshell, I think in our society, we stop with the light, left hemisphere. We don't allow it to be reintegrated into a, a much bigger, richer picture, which is in touch with all the stuff that the left hemisphere doesn't know it doesn't know. This reminds me quite a lot of Richard Tarnas, who... Yes, who I'm afraid I haven't read. Yeah, no, I, I, he, his book had a huge impact on me when I was, when I was at university, but, but effectively he said that... He, he told the story of Western philosophy and said that it had become more and more isolating, more and more a prison of the intellect, and that the way out would be to re-embrace intuition. Yeah. re-embrace direct knowledge and that we couldn't get out until we did. Um, so it just, it seems that it maps on very, very clearly to, to the, the picture that you're, you're painting. Yes, um, the, 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 that's right. Uh, the other thing one ought to say is that philosophy has made strides in the last mm, couple of hundred years. And I think that um, there's been a redressing of that. Uh, particularly in, I mean, early on in, in Hegel and in the, the German idealist Fichte Schelling and so forth, uh, to an extent in Nietzsche, who is um, a mad genius, um, uh, uh, but mainly in the tradition of two, um, two groups, 
One is the American pragmatists, uh, C.S. Peirce, uh, William James, and John Dewey. And the other is the um, phenomenological tradition in Europe, uh, Heidegger, uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Scheler, Husserl to a degree. Uh, so I think, in, uh, and the, the later Wittgenstein would fit with that, the earlier Wittgenstein uh, not. You, there was a comment on the RSA video from a physicist who said that he found it very useful in looking at why they were so far away from coming up with a theory of everything because his sense was that they're looking at the individual details and, and not looking at the whole. Does that make sense? It certainly does and I hadn't seen that um, comment but um, well one of the gratifying things has been the number of physicists who have written to me saying uh, there are enormous resonances between your work and what we are doing in physics. Uh, I am um, far too unskilled to, to recognise those, although I have an idea of the shape of what they're talking about. And recently I've been trying to acquaint myself with quantum field theory, which is actually a very interesting development out of quantum mechanics. Um, and I will try to write a bit about that in my current book, but only after running it by some uh, very kind physicist friends. But I think what is um, important is that what I'm saying, if it is true, will apply to everything because it's about the nature of reality. And the people who are at the coalface of reality are poets and physicists. And, you know, they have written to me saying uh, how, how much they feel a resonance. But what has struck me is that people that I didn't expect, like lawyers and people in the world of finance and economists, you know, are some of my most um, uh, frequent correspondents. Because they say what you're describing is exactly the problems in our realm. So I'm delighted because I never had the slightest belief or hope that this could happen. But that what I'm saying has been picked up by people in all walks of life.